you're not attracting a good hater to you, then maybe you should examine things and maybe you need to make some changes because there's nothing quite like having a good old hater every once in a while. So, <clears throat> the same people today <coughs> that if they tune into this and begin listening to me, the same people that will say, what is a pastor a minister of the gospel doing talking about money. These same people will wake up tomorrow morning and they will spend 40, 50, maybe 60 hours of their week working for money. And then they will think, why is he talking about it on Sunday? You know, we, we've got to move past that. Now, I can't, I can't sit here and say that I'm going to influence or change all of the body of Christ concerning this, but I know this, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. And as for this household of which God has placed me as a spiritual father over, I will not allow people to sit in ignorance or in darkness concerning debt or money. Amen. I won't do it any longer. I know what I know because I have, I have studied beyond imagination concerning these things. They didn't originate with me. They originated with God. They originated with his word. I would dare say that if I asked you a scripture about faith, you could probably tell me a verse of scripture concerning faith or prayer. As I said, there are over 500 verses of scripture concerning faith or prayer in the Bible. But there are 2,350 plus scriptures concerning money. If you ask a Christian about these, that means there's over four to five, four to five times many verses of scripture in the Bible. So we're coming from the word of God first. Amen. We're going to go from the word of God. And start talking about what does the word of God say about money? What does it say about finances? What does the money, what does the Bible say about money? What does it say about how I should be dealing with this? What do I need to learn? Your life, you're going to spend much of your life either working for money, spending money, saving money, or paying bills with money. Mm -hmm. Now how could I as a father, not speak on this. Most money problems, maybe you should write this down for yourself, most money problems are not money itself, but rather how it is handled. How it is handled. Most money problems are not money itself but how it is handled. I find many people in the body of Christ and in the Christian church, they will talk about money as if it is evil. Well, I have a suggestion for you. You log on to my website, there's a button there that takes you to sow a seed, and it'll take you to a PayPal link. If you believe that money is so evil, then you can send me all of yours, and I will rid you of all your evils. If it's so evil, then why are you spending the majority of your life working for it? Amen. Are you working for that which is evil? Money in itself is not evil, but the Bible tells us in 1 Timothy chapter 6 that it is the love of money that is the root of all evil. It didn't say that the love of money is evil. It said it is the root of all evil. So money in itself is not evil. But the love of money is a root of evil. So let's look back at Deuteronomy 8. Deuteronomy chapter 8. I'm encouraging you to take this chapter of Scripture this week, read through it, look over it, meditate on it, let God speak to you about it. Because God says these things over and over throughout this chapter. He talks about multiplying, mm -hmm. multiplying you. He says that he's going to bring you into a good land. 
That's a good place. Don't you want to de dwell in a good place? Yes, sir. He said there'll be a land of brooks, fountains, springs in verse 7. It'll be a land of wheat and barley and vines and fig trees and pomegranates and olive oil and honey. I enjoy all of those things. He said it'll be a land where there won't be scarceness of bread and you won't lack anything in it. That sounds like a good place to be in. Yes, it does. Anybody in here enjoy lack? Raise your hand. I didn't think so. So what's the problem? The Bible tells us that if a man lacks wisdom, that he needs to ask of God. You know, the Lord was speaking some things to me about that this morning. I'm, gonna, I'm not going to stop on that, but I will tell you this. We will receive what we ask for, but we will also have what we know. Because God says that his people are destroyed for a lack of knowledge. He says, in this land you'll dig and there'll be brass, there'll be copper. You'll eat to the full, you'll be blessed. It's a good land where God is, is bringing you to. He said, you'll eat and you'll be full. You'll have a good house, verse 12. Maybe some of you need to claim that over your life. You'll have a good house. I'll have a good house. Verse 13, he says, your flocks is going to multiply, your silver and gold is going to multiply. All that you have will multiply. God is a God of multiplication. Yes, he is. He will add to you. You know, the blessing of the Lord makes rich, and he adds no sorrow to it. But God is also a God of multiplication. Now, some people may tune into this, and they'll say, you know, what is this guy Todd doing talking about money? Is he one of those prosperity preachers? Well, yes, absolutely I am, because God's word is a book about prosperity. Amen. If God is your God, then he desires to prosper you. Psalm 35 and verse 27 says this, the Lord takes pleasure in the prosperity of his servant. I'm one of those. And God takes pleasure in that. If God takes pleasure in it, then who am I to argue with it? Anyone I believe that argues with it is prideful. They want to attain it by their own hand. It's hard. Well, Deuteronomy 18, 8, excuse me, Deuteronomy 8, he says in verse 17, he says, when you get all these things, don't say it was by my hand that you have gotten these things, that you have gotten this wealth. It's verse 18 that points us because it is, it is he, say that with me, it is he, it is he. that gives you Gives you power, power to get wealth. To get wealth. Some of you need to begin to confess that. You need to begin to believe that. But first of all, you're going to have to begin to understand what is wealth. Some of you may be in a position where you're in debt up to your eyeballs. You don't know what to do. I don't know where you are financially. The only way I would know is if you came and talked to me personally. But I do have to talk to you about what God's Word says about money. As we've been reading from Samuel, you know, David. Uh, the band of people that came to David, they were stressed out. They were in debt and they were discontented. Most of them were probably uh, stressed out because they were in debt. And they were probably discontented because they were in debt. I noticed that that one's right in the middle of everything. <laughs> debt right in the middle of stress. Debt right in the middle of being discontented. If you're in debt, you probably will be discontented with life. Now, I'm going to tell you some things that may sound weird, bizarre, and I'm not, I'm not going to tell you that all debt is bad. But I will tell you this. I don't believe that being in debt is God's will. It is not God's perfect will for my life. There may be a time when you have to be a borrower, but God's word says you will lend and not borrow. I believe that God wants to bring me into the position where I'm a lender and not a borrower. Amen. All right? So, looking at verse 18 of Deuteronomy 8 and 18. Would you write this down for yourself? It is God that gives you the ability to create wealth. It is God that gives you the ability to create wealth. That's literally what it means. The power to get, the power to obtain, the power to produce, the power to make. 
God will give you the power to do this. You are not a victim. Many of you may be thinking this way. You may think, I don't make enough. That's possible. But it may not be in your making. It may be in your managing. There you go. If you're not managing your money properly, you will be thinking you don't make enough. Let me say this and write this down for yourself. Money is a tool to create more money. Money is a tool to create more money. Not carelessly spending it. Money is a tool to create more money. Not carelessly spending it. Just like I said, money is something that you're going to have to manage. Money is something that you have to... April, could you hand me that book uh, up here on the front? If you haven't read Dr. Crite's book money on money matters, maybe you should read that. I've read many, 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 many books on money. I read every day on money. This is a great book. You've got to start somewhere. If you're going to increase, you're going to have to increase your knowledge. If you're going to increase, you're going to have to increase your understanding. If you're expecting God to increase you, then you're going to have to increase what you understand. Get wisdom, get understanding. In all of your getting, you've got to get an understanding. So I'm going to talk with you about many things concerning money. This will be a great book for you to read. It's not a very long book. It's, oh, let's see, about 90 pages. You can get through that pretty quickly. Proverbs 24 tells us that money doesn't come without labor, but poverty does. Money doesn't come without labor, but poverty does. Amen. Money doesn't come without labor, but poverty does. You are not a victim. You are not a victim to the wealthy. You are not a victim to the wealthy. I'm going to get some amens when I get into this money thing. Amen. Can you advance this page for me? I'm going to teach y'all something today. I'm going to come from God's word concerning this. I want to talk to you about what I call a quantum principle. I don't expect you to get all this and know all this right off the bat, but you will have an understanding of it. First of all, I believe that all the secret of all wealth creation is found in this word. The secret of all wealth creation is found in this word. That's right. There is a principle that God has laid out concerning the number 10. Concerning the number 10. Now I'm going to lay some things out. I want you guys to pay attention. I know when I pull this out, you'll be, you will be. Mm -hmm. I have here. Can I get somebody to, one of you guys? <laughs> Everybody wants to hold the money, don't they? Yeah. You that know, evil money. You got your Bible? Yes, I got my Bible. I'm the only guy. I'm going to do it. Come here, Asa. I want you to hold these up right here, okay? You know what these are, right? Yep. I want you to hold those up in front of everybody, right? Hold them up. Come on over here. Okay. How many of you got there? Count them for me. Ten. He's got ten, ten dollar what? Bills. bills. I don't want more bills. You want more bills? Mm -hmm. no. You want more bills? I don't. I don't want more bills. This, my friends, is one hundred dollars, right? Legal tender. This is a Federal Reserve note. It is, in a sense, a bill because it was created out of debt. Mm. I'll talk more about that later. <coughs> but here's something that is found in God's Word. I want you to take note of what I'm saying because I'm going to give you this and you've got to begin to think this way. God has, hold those for me, Asa. 
God has laid out his, in his word, and it's all through his word, this thing that I call a principle based on ten. Say that with me. A, a principle based on ten. A principle based on ten. All the way through God's word, you will see this number, ten. Not this note, but the, the number ten. <laughs> all the way from Genesis to Revelation. If you follow, if you were to just do a search on the number 10 all the way through the scripture, you would start seeing how God operates on this principle called 10. Hold that right there. What am I talking about? I'm going to talk to you about percentages. All right? I want you to understand percentages. What does God tell us? Come, come right here, just a little bit this way. Can you hold that up for me? Now, God, through his word, let's turn them around the other way. Yep, there you go. God, through his word, has mandated something all the way through his word. All right? There's 10, $10 notes. We know that this equates to 100, right? Mm -hmm. 100. So when I begin to talk to you, you have to begin to see through the scripture. And I'm going to walk you gingerly through this, that God thinks in terms of percentages we think in terms of numbers. God thinks in terms of percentages. This is very important. This is very key to understanding finance and understanding money. We know that through the word, okay, that the patriarchs operated. Are you find this with me in Genesis? Okay, flip over here with me. Genesis. Philip, you don't mind him being on camera with me, do you? Okay. Hey, Mikey. Genesis chapter 14. Find this with me real quickly. Genesis chapter 14. Genesis chapter 14. If I don't feel that y'all are hungry for this, I'll move on now. I'll move on to something else. Because I'm, I'm succeeding in this. I'm succeeding in this. Let me, let me just stop and tell you this. Less than a month ago, less than a couple of weeks ago, I stood here and I told y'all I sold a thousand dollar seed, right? In less than a month, that's already came back to me multiplied. Amen. Not through, not through paycheck, not. Through. Men gave them to your bosom. Yep. Somebody sold twice that back to me. You can't mock God. Amen. God will not be mocked. If you sow, you'll reap. I know that people have manipulated people. And in God, in God, through God's word, oh, yeah. we have seen people taken advantage of. Please the flock. I'm not going to be taken advantage of. And I'm not trying to take advantage of anyone. I'm going to operate off of God's word. If I'm going to have an understanding of money and finances, I'm going to obtain it first and foremost from God's word. I'm not saying that there are not people out here that don't have an understanding, because there are people that do have an understanding. Jesus even said, maybe you should make for yourself friends of the wealthy people. Why? Because there may be something lacking in your information. Now, God has said something in his word based on the numbers of 100. Now, you may see $100, but I'm talking about in the terms of 100. We talk about things of 100%. My heart is 100% in this. I'm, I'm giving 100%. Percentage is huge. Genesis 14, you will see that Abraham, first of all, he is called the father of faith, right? He's called the father of faith through the word of God. Abraham goes out to battle against some kings, and he comes back because he's victorious, he comes back with a great spoil. If you look with me here in verse 18, it says, And Melchizedek, the king of Salem, brought forth bread and wine, and he was the priest of the Most High God. And he blessed him and said, Blessed be Abram of the Most High God, possessor of heaven and earth. Blessed 
Be the Most High God which has delivered your enemies into your hand. And what did Abraham do? He gave him tithes of all. Now y'all may sit here and say, oh, he's fixed to preach on tithing. No, I'm going to talk to you about the number 10. Here's what Abraham did. We're going to pretend that Asa's Ab Abram. He's, he's gone out and he's come back with an increase. What did Abram do? What did he do, Asa? He gave it to me. He gave him a tithe. What would that be? What would a tenth of a hundred be? Yep. Give me that ten. One of them at least. That's what Abraham did. He gave him a percentage. Who? He gave a tithe or a percent, first of all. So I'm going to start opening this up for you to understand something. What does Abram have left over here? He has nine tens left, right? God, watch this now, 10 is God's factor as an economist of all things. This is God's factoring of all things. 10 is the beginning point for you to understand. 10 is the beginning point for you to understand this. Listen to me very closely. 10 is the beginning point the beginning point for you to understand this. And you may say, Todd, I understand tithing. I tithe. I've been tithing. I've been tithing my whole Christian life. I've been tithing uh, as long as I can remember. My mama tithed, my daddy tithed, my granddaddy tithed, and a whole family tithed. This is the, you've got to listen to what I'm saying very closely. This is a percentage key. This key begins to unlock this key because this is what you're dealing with. Some of you may not have gotten this far. See, I see people, hold up for a second. I see people all the time. Oh, it just. You know when you know something and somebody else doesn't know something and they talk, they talk in ignorance, does it irritate you? Yes. I mean, it just irritates me. I hear people all the time. I see it on Facebook and everywhere else. You ain't got a tithe here in the New Testament. You, tithing is a man-made thing. Tithing, tithing is Old Testament. Tithing is part of the law. Tithing is a principle. Tithing is a principle. Now, you want God to bless you, right? You want to be blessed, right? <laughs> Right. You want to be blessed. Yes, sir. Then you have to know how God operates. Because God doesn't operate according to your thinking. Some people, <laughs> they can't, they, they don't understand how, hand it, hand it to me again, Asa, how doing this begins to change this. Because God works on percentages, not numbers. Blessing. Let me say it these ways. God has principle through faith. I'm going to give this back to you again. God has principle through faith, the law of ten. God is, he has principled, I'm saying this is a principle of God, the law of percentage. Numbers will tell you quantity. Write this down for yourself. A number will, if he says I have $100, that tells me the quantity of dollars. But a percentage tells me something different. A percentage tells me a quantum. This is my teaching. I ain't never heard nobody teach on this. This is, this, this is my original work right here. A percentage tells me a quantum. Say that word with me, quantum. Quantum. Y'all probably heard of quantum theory, right? Yes. But do you know what it is? Yes. No. No. Pay attention then. A quantum, when I say that God works by percentages, this means that God works by a share or by a portion of 100. I'm taking you to math class now. He works on the portions of 100. This is the whole secret behind a quantum. Hand me that 10 again. 
When that ten leaves his hand, there is then placed towards him the quantum of an advantage, a benefit, a profit, a proportion, or a, listen real closely, this is a fraction that causes an attraction. Mm. You better hear what I just said. This is a fraction of this. But God is attracted to the number 10. How do I know that? He gave 10 commandments. When Abraham went to uh, sin for a wife, for his son Isaac, he sent 10 camels. And then he gave to Rebekah, uh, I believe it was 10 pieces of gold. He also, when uh, Israel, when he was coming back, I mean, 10 is all through the, the scripture. I mean, it's over and over and over. If I went through all of this, you'd be, you'd be like, what in the world? But this portion, this percentage causes an attraction. This is a fraction that causes an attraction. God is attracted to the number 10. So God has purported that, first of all, you understand your income in fractional proportions. Listen real closely to me. You may think, well, I make such and such number. You have to start thinking in proportions and fractions. This will, this will help you with budgeting. It will help you in all of your finances. You have to begin to think in terms of fractions. Anybody who is an economist, they always talk in fractions. God is an economist. The word to be a faithful steward means that you're a faithful economist. Economos. A fractional proportion of 10 is the first basis of God's covenant. This is what Abraham was demonstrating. Some people say, well, why is he giving a tenth to Melchizedek? Because Abram is demonstrating his covenant with God. <coughs> this is the demonstration of it. This is the, this is the whole genesis to the revelation of increase. Let me say that again. This is the genesis of revelation for increase. So 10 is the factor that God uses. 10 is the beginning point for you understanding the other nine. Hold that one up separate. There's 10 tens, right? Or 100. We think in terms of dollars. God thinks in terms of percents. So let me say this now in another way to you. What is this? What is this? What is this? You say it's money? It's an idea. I'm not, I don't want to confuse anybody in this. Listen real closely to me. This is a store of energy and labor. That's all it really is. It's a store of energy and labor. Hmm. <clears throat> Someone, if you're, if you're an employee and you go to work for $10 an hour, right? For every hour of your life, someone's giving you one of these. So you're able to store your energy and labor into this. That's what this is. This is not just a tool for you to get what you want. I'm, but let me tell you, there's a tremendous amount of resistance that, that I am facing at this moment because there is a, a vast spirit of poverty that is so settled over this area. Amen. It does not understand this. They don't understand this. They don't understand the, the potability of it. They don't understand the possibility of it. They don't understand how it moves. They don't understand how to manage it. They don't understand even what it is. This is stored up energy. It's stored up labor. When you get a paycheck at the end of the week or the end of the month or every two weeks or whatever, however income is coming into you, it's basically a store of energy and wealth, or a, excuse me, a store of labor. God operates his house as what? A storehouse. It's a house of storing. That's the principle that God operates off. So money is simply a store. You're storing something. 
God's house is also a store. It's a storehouse. Things are stored there. Money has to begin to convert. You convert money. Let me hold on these again. You convert money into purchasing power. You, you might go buy a product or a service, but you know, ultimately this is, is the storability of it. Or you may see it as an opportunity to invest. I asked you a couple of weeks ago, when this comes into your hand, what do you see? Do you see the ability to pay a bill? Do you, what do you see? When money comes into my hand, the first thought that comes into my hand is not what I'm going to go get with it, but how I'm going to multiply it. Mm -hmm. How I'm going to multiply it. And I work on the principle of quantum. First of all, whenever I increase, I do what Asa does, has just done. Whenever I increase, I have operated on this principle for more than two decades, two and a half decades. Go ahead. You're going, no, no, hand me the one. I tithe. I do exactly what Abram did. I do exactly what Jacob said he would do. Genesis 28, flip over there with me so you can see from God's word. You've got to see that Abram understood the covenant that he was in with God, and this was a covenant of faith. I'm in a faith covenant. I'm coming to you from the word of God. I'm trying to make this very base. I don't want this to seem simple because I'm going, I'm going, I have to go here in order to increase this. Let me say this. Ten is not you being generous with God. Ten is not you being generous with God. The only thing that you have done is you have taken a fraction or one-tenth. Can you write on here for me with a marker? Why don't you put up on there in a fraction, one slash ten. One slash ten. I think they're back there behind the drums. When I tithe, what have I done? I have caused an attraction. I have caused an attraction. My fraction, my fraction, let me hold these for a second. I'm going I'm to pretend I just got paid. I just got paid 100 bucks. What am I going to do? I'm going to think in terms of percent. I'm in covenant with God. Oh, look. Hold that. What did I just do? The man of God that is in Abram's life is Melchizedek. He gave him tithes of all. I said of all. Right. What happened? Abram has continuously increased through his whole life. Right. He operates on a principle of percentages. This principle of percentage has caused an attraction where? When he did that, an attraction, there was a God attraction over here. I'm trying to tell you something. The fraction determines an attraction. All right? So I'm looking at Genesis 28. Genesis 28. <coughs> Verse 22. This is where Jacob wakes up from his dream, and he says, And this stone which I have set for a pillar shall be God's house. Right? We're dealing with God's house. And all that you will give me, notice he, where it comes from. He knows that whatever comes to him right. has come from God. There you go. He says, I will surely give a what? Ten. Unto who? God. You. you. God. How's he going to give it back? Into God's house. He's already said this is God's house. And everything that you give me, he's just established the same principle. How did he know this? Well, Abram knew it. And Abram told Isaac, and Isaac told Jacob, and Jacob told all of his sons, and they all understood this. And all of Israel has operated on the principle of ten from all the way from Abram. Thank you. You can go sit down now, Asa. All right, so stay with me, because I've got to talk to you about money. There's potential in all of this, right? Oh yeah. There's potential in it. I can I can do there's a whole lot of things I can do. 
If I'm a good person, I'll do good with it. If I'm an evil person, I'll do evil with it. That's right. Money is simply a multiplier. It's a multiplier of what you are. Money is a revealer of all things. Ecclesiastes tells us this. That's why I believe that Jesus talked so much about money. Because money reveals everything. I can tell you who you are, what you do, where you go. If I just looked at your checkbook, if I looked at where you spent your money, it tells you everything about you. It tells you what you like, what you don't like. It tells you who you like, who you don't like. It tells you what you believe, what you don't believe. If you say you believe God's word, then you're going to have to believe him according to tithing. It's that simple. I believe what God's word says about tithing. Y'all say, you know, I've been heard a million sermons on tithing. I'm talking to you from the point of a percentage. Because once you get the percentage factor in your mind, you're going to start, you've got to start thinking of everything from that point. That's why this becomes established. This is the key. It's the keyhole. It's the entry point. It is the entry point. You may say, well, that's just me departing with my money. No, it is not. This is God establishing his covenant in your life. We just read in Deuteronomy 8 and 18 that it is the Lord that gives you the power to get wealth. You've got to understand something about there's different terms. There is being rich and then there's being wealthy. They're vastly different. Say those with me. Rich, rich. and wealthy. Wealth. Vastly different. You can be a rich person because you inherited money. But that doesn't mean you know what to do with it. There's a difference between being poor and being in poverty. Poor just simply means you don't have resources. Poverty means you are in a, a state of mind. Poverty is a state of mind. You can have a lot of money but have a poverty mindset. You don't know what to do with it. Mm. This is why many times people who inherit money or win money, they wind up broke. Why? Because it doesn't matter how much you put in their hand, they don't know how to manage it, they don't know how to move it, and they don't know how to multiply it. That's right. They know how to spend it. They know how to go through it. They know how to decrease. They don't know how to increase. There is a key in God's word here with the percentage that when you learn to operate off of percentages and you first have to establish that in the covenant with God through the principle of 10. When you begin to establish this, because I'm talking to you about working your way out of debt, you're going to have to begin to understand percentages. That's how all the banks do it. They do it in APR, MPR, monthly percentage rate, annual percentage rate. Everything is based on a percent. You've got, to, you've got to stop thinking in numbers and start thinking in percentage. This is going, this is going to hurt some of you. It's going to challenge some of you because you're not used to it. Let me say this to you. If you went through the public education system all of your life, I don't care if you went to four years of college and eight years and eight years to, to become a doctor, that does not mean that you know jack diddly squat about money. The banks want to keep you poor. The school system wants to keep you poor because they are not educating you concerning it. Do not think that understanding money, the, the only difference between you and someone who is wealthy is what you know and what you don't know. That's it. Amen. If you don't know it, it's because you haven't sought to know it. If you don't know it, it's because you have not sought to know it. You're not a victim here. You are not a victim. There is no one under the sound of my voice. I'm not the victim of wealthy people. I'm not the, the victim of, of people oppressing me or keeping me down. I'm not the victim of a scandal. Why? Because you, you were born into a system. You were born into this system. And this is the system that you operate off of. And you've got to begin to think differently. Let me show y'all something, because I've got to get some, some pictures in your head so you start. Can you go over there and operate this for me? I'm going to talk about some stuff that could probably really get me in trouble, but I don't care. I've known it for over a decade. Watch this as I go up here. Because I'm talking to you about money, right? You want to understand the money. From 19, excuse me, from 1791, right? This is in the United States. From 1791, this is when... 
the United States created its money system. It's currency. It's currency. We operated on the same system from 1791 until about 1939. Okay? What was that system? Gold. Can you hit the next button? Gold. Gold standard. Yep. You see this thing right here? You can't see it that clearly. But we operated off of the gold standard. Really, the gold standard didn't kick in until about 1834. Before that, we pretty much operated off of silver because the United States didn't realize that it had as much gold as it did in the ground until it started to be mined out. Can you hit the next button? Yep, keep going. This one ounce of gold, one ounce of gold, one more button. One ounce of gold for 148 years in America was equal to two of these, right? Or $20. This one looks a lot different than what you're used to seeing. It has this little orange looking seal on it that was called a gold certificate. These did not appear until after the Civil War. You back up. So we operated from 1791 until 1861 without paper money. When I held this up, y'all said this was money. This is not money. Nope. This is not money. Idea. This is called currency. It's also known as fiat currency. This is non-convertible. You can't convert this into anything. What is this? What's this, what is this made of? Cotton. It's paper. The United States government, it costs them four cents to produce this. They can put whatever they want on it. They put 1, 2, 5, 10, 20, 50, 100. Doesn't matter if, it, if it's a $100 note, they, it only costs them $0.04 cent to produce. When I turn, talk in terms of intrinsic, this has no value to it. Nothing. Let me show you another example of that. Watch here. I've got to teach you all some things about money. <coughs> Come up here for a second, Chauncey. You hold this for me. I'll give you some big money. Look at here. Read that out to them, Chauncey. That is $10,000. What are the pesos? Oh, yeah. Now I'm going to talk in terms that y'all don't understand. 10,000 pesos. Woo wee. That sounds like big money, don't it, Elijah? 10,000 pesos. I'm like 10,000 there. Mexico, 10,000 pesos. 1991. Okay, 1991. This thing, they had to start putting a lot of zeros behind it because it wouldn't buy much. So one year later, they came out with this thing in 1992. Read that one to them, Chauncey. 1992. 10 new pesos. 10. Oh, we got 10 Nuevo pesos. Nuevo pesos. They collapsed this one, the 10,000. This is no more good. Sorry. We don't use this anymore. You now use this. And if you've got these, the 10,000 ones, you come trade them in for the Nuevo peso. So... These became equal. Are y'all following me? Mm. You following? Yeah. Well, they look exactly alike, don't they? Don't those look alike, Sherry? They do. I mean, they look almost identical. So this has got 10,000, that got 10. Well, people was getting confused. So they said, oh, in 1992, we need to come out with a new one. <laughs> Can you see that one? That's this is 10 pesos, 1992. So I've got... A 10 peso 1992 and a 10 peso 1992, right? They look the same. I mean, they look completely different, right? This, these were all equal in purchasing value. Wow. But this one, they said, no good no more. Bye-bye. This one, uh, it looks too much like the old one. Bye-bye. Let's come out with this one. Now, you may think 10 pesos. Is 10 pesos 
equal to $10? No. It's got a number on it, right? No, it's not. Why, why, y'all don't believe it? No. It's got 10 on it. Why can't I walk into Burger King and get me two $5 meals with this? Because this is America, not Mexico. Well, it's worth 10 though. In Mexico. Not here, it's not. Not here, it's not. So what's the difference then, Jason? Um, we're in different countries. Okay, we're in different countries. So this tells me something. They can put whatever number that they want on this. Y'all pay close attention how they work this. They can put whatever number. They can make it a million, a trillion. I've seen a, tri a $10 trillion dollar bill Zimbabwe. from Zimbabwe. Yep. Zimbabwe. Now, if you walked into the Bank of the United States, would they convert that over to $10, $10 trillion dollars United States money? No, they put whatever number they want on it. Does anybody know what this is worth? Does, does anybody know what, what this would translate to? About one dollar. No. Fifty-two cent. You gonna look it up? Yep. Yeah, it's fi about fifty cent US. So if I walk into an exchange and exchange this, I'm gonna get fifty cent. Fifty cent. US cent. Okay. Here, I'll pass them around. Y'all can look at them. Don't be trying to keep my notes, though. Is it 10 pesos? Y'all can look at those while I'm talking. Okay, I'm talking money with you. Why am I talking this? So we can learn the currency system? Yeah, you've got to learn what's happening and what's going on. Watch here. For 148 years in the United States, this was $20, one ounce of gold. It was actually $20.69. It fluctuated a little bit. But then we had to, can you forward this? Then you come out, can you see this on camera, Chauncey? You can zoom in if you need to. No, you ain't gotta do that, just follow me over here. Yes, sir. We're going forward. So then they created paper currency, why? Because there wasn't enough gold to keep the system going. So this was created, say this with me, this was an I-O-U. This was an I-O-U. It was an I-O-U. Mm. When the government ran out of gold to make money, they started printing these. This was an I-O-U. This meant that the government owed you, this $20 note is a, was a gold, uh, you could exchange this for one of these. These were equal. Okay, if you had one of these, you could go to a bank and on demand, demand an ounce of gold, one ounce. Same thing, for 148 years, hit that again. Now watch what's happened. <laughs> I want you to watch this, because I want you to see. Hit the next button. In 1933, In April of 1933, on a Sunday night, Franklin D. Roosevelt, President of the United States, signed an executive order, and in the stroke of a pen, he outlawed this thing. Hit that button one more time. Sorry, you can't own this anymore. Watch. American citizens were told they could not own gold anymore. If you kept more than, if you had more than five ounces of gold, you had to turn it into a repository or the bank. Or face a $10,000 fine and I believe two years in prison. So in one stroke of the pen on a Sunday night, everything changed. That law stood until 1971. 40 years, you could not own. Y'all you got to see what's happened. Now watch. 1971, 
1971, Richard Nixon took us completely off of the gold standard, completely. That meant if you had any of these, sorry. And if it was foreign, sorry. If you held money overseas, most United States money is held overseas if you don't know that. The majority of United States money is held overseas. There's a reason for that. I won't explain it right now. In 71, he took us off the gold standard. In 1974, uh, Gerald Ford, in the stroke of a pen, made it legal for Americans to own gold again. You can now buy gold again. Was gold this price again? No. No, oh, no. Uh -uh. no, no, no. It had started changing. So now, after you, for 40 years, can you bring up the next thing? There's my $20 currency, right? The $20 bill. This thing started skyrocketing. And I'm going to tell you a little bit of history why. In 1913, the Federal Reserve System was created. The Federal Reserve System is not a government entity. When you read on here and it says Federal Reserve Note, this is not a government entity. It is a private organization. It is a private organization. They have the sole contract with the United States to print money. Yeah. And they print a lot of it. Yes. Now, does anybody want to guess today in 2019, if you were to go get this, anybody guess how many of these you would need? Don't, don't do it. Just in your head. I want you to tell me. Can you guess how many of these you would now need to get one of these? You need a lot. Joe says five. Jason says a lot. 120, 50. 120, 50. 55. 55. 30. All right, start showing them, April. 800 something. Slowly here, slowly. There's three. Count with me. Four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, eighteen, nineteen, twenty, one, twenty-two, three, twenty-four. 25, 26, 27, 28, 29, 30, 31, 32, 33, 34, 35, 36, 37, 38, 39, 40. Stop right there. Y'all think that's enough? No. No. Okay, let's keep going. 41, 42, 43, 44, 45, 46, 47, 48, 49, 50. 51, 52, 53, 54, 55, 56, 57, 58, 59, 60, 61, 62, 63, 64, 65, 66, 67, 68, 59, 70, 71, 72, 73, 74. Whoops. 74. Actually, uh, it went up on Friday, so now it's yeah. 76. Yeah. Can you give me up that? So what happened if this stayed the same for 148 years and in 80 years this happened? What happened? What happened? Currency went up. They printed. Oh no, it's much the opposite, Jason. <laughs> printed more money than we had. Than we needed. Sure they diluted it. They diluted the market. It doesn't have as much buying power now as it did then. Has this changed? No. no. You can go get one that has 1878 and it still has $20 on the back of it. It hasn't changed. It's still minted the same. This didn't change. It's still what it is. Something else changed over here. This is where I'm trying to tell you that someone has stolen from you. Oh, yeah. Someone has stolen from you. Big brother. And they did it very slowly to where you wouldn't notice it. <laughs> this is why many weeks ago I asked somebody in here, how much was a Coke when you were a kid? A nickel. How much is it now? $2. $1.85. $1.85. Did the Coke change? Mm -hmm. Bottled with plastic now. 
but the liquid didn't change. What's changing? The prices. Prices aren't changing. Money. The value of the currency. This is what's changing. This is what's changing. Money is changing. Money is changing very quickly. Very, very quickly it's changing. You've got to get an understanding and start wrapping your mind around this. I don't expect you to be a financial wizard, but you've got to begin to understand what is happening, and it's happening rapidly, and it's happening quickly. Yes. This has changed. <coughs> can, you, can you back some of these out? <laughs> this is changing very rapidly and quick, quickly. It has changed in the last uh, 10 years more than it has in the... the Verse 70 of this. It's happening rapidly because the money is deflating. What did I tell you this was? This was a store of energy and a store of wealth. You realize that my grandfather worked 55 hours a week for less than this. Yep. So he stored, he stored 55 hours of labor into this. If he were alive right now, this would barely buy him two cheeseburgers. Right? That'd be quite disappointing. Oh, yeah. That you put 55 hours of labor into this, and all you're going to get is two cheeseburgers. You have to begin to think in terms of percentage, because they've already baked into this thing, this money, that we call money. This is not money. In... 1912, J.P. Morgan said, gold is the only money and everything else is credit. Gold is the only money and everything else is credit. Let me say that again. J.P. Morgan said in 1912 that gold is the only money and that everything else is credit. Now you may be sitting here thinking, Todd, I'm just trying to get through the week. But let me tell you what God said. Deuteronomy 8 and 18. It is he that gives you the power to get wealth. You've got to begin to understand money, understand what it means to be wealthy, what it means to be rich. If you don't understand these things, then you, you are going to, you are being taken for a ride, and you're being taken for a ride hard until eventually this ride is going to end yep. with a hard, hard ending for you. If you don't understand what's going on, they can change it like I showed you with Mexico. This has happened, what I showed you over here with Mexico, this has happened to over 600 currencies in the world that do not exist anymore. 600 times this has happened in the last uh, less than 150 years. Currencies collapse and they come back out and reevaluate them. Why is this? Because when you have a centralized banking system, they bake something into the cake called interest. Interest. If you're not watching what's happening, why did, why did, what did I tell you gold was going to do the other day, Johnson? It will go up. It was going to go up. Why? Because the Federal Reserve cut, it, uh, raised, uh, cut interest rates by 2%. Exactly. They cut the interest rates. Bam. I knew. Watch. Gold will go up. Why? Because people are running from this. They're running away from it. They're running away from it because you may think, well, they're cutting interest rates. That means that I can go buy a house cheaper. I can go buy a car cheaper. No, they just deflated, they just deflated this purchasing power. What's going, what happens? What happens at 3%? Let me show you, because I'm talking percentages. Would you got a marker? Right here, sir. I'm going to follow you, too. Okay, 3%. You got a hundred bucks over here, right? You got a hundred bucks in your savings account. Let's say you got a hundred. What's going to happen? In one year's time, in one year, you bake in the cake over here 3% deflation. You call it inflation. I call it deflation. Things are deep. This is already baked into the cake. This is going to happen. Next year, you only, this money only has 97% of its purchasing power. Do that over the course of 30 years, and what do you get? You've worked your lifetime. You've got an eraser. Uh, You've worked your lifetime. You do the math. 
30 times 3% is what? 90%. 90%. So I don't know what age you are or what age you started working, but watch. If you're not beating this number, you're losing. If you're not beating this number, this is why I talk percentages constantly, constantly. I'm beating the 3% curve. You, you've got to begin to listen to God. Listen to me. You've got, God knows all of these things. He understands this stuff inside and out. He knows it better than anybody. You've got to begin to listen to the Lord on a whole different level. You, you, you've got to stop just trying to listen to the Lord to get through the week, to just to try to survive. That is not God's will for you. If God says that he will give you the power to get well, then you've got to begin to listen to him and what he's saying. Because he's talking about things in the earth. You've got to start listening on a whole different level. This means I'm going to have to stop here because it's getting late. 90% of this. What's 90% of 100? $90. So I'm left with 10 in purchasing power at the end of all of this. That's where it's going. That's why this has changed. Are you following me? That's why this has changed. Do you think that this is going to change? Oh, yeah. Do you think that is which way it's going to go? Do you think it's going to start backing up? Look at where it's going. Now, I didn't tell you to go out here and buy gold. I didn't do that. I didn't tell you any of that. I just simply am telling you this. I use this as an example to open your eyes and awaken to this. You're spending so much time working for these. And 10 and 20, 30 years from now, at 90%, this would be the equivalent of a dollar. You put an hour of your life into this, and it's eventually going to give you a dollar worth of, of purchasing power. Mm. You've got to understand somebody is stealing from you. You're being stolen from. This is why they have created all of these programs. FDR, here he is, one of the biggest socialists ever. I don't, I don't have a problem saying that. Same man that did this created Social Security. Why? Taking money from people, creating a system, and when he hands it back to them, it will not purchase what it would in that day. Would not. This is why many senior citizens, they can barely get through. They've put in way more than they will ever get back out. And when they do get it back out, it will not have the same purchasing power. That's right. They have been stolen from their whole lives. If I would have taken that money and invested it and turned a 10% profit a year, you'd have more money than you could imagine. This has all been systems to create over time. I'm not trying to make the American government evil or nothing like this, but when these systems become in place, they don't, they don't come unhinged. They don't stop. Nope. Once it's created, it's going to keep going. But you have to know. Here's the whole thing. You're not a victim to any of this. You have to know what wealthy people know. They know how to get around it. They know how to beat it. It don't matter if you tax if you increase taxes, it ain't going to change a wealthy person's mind because he knows how to get around it. He'll always find a way around it. There's always a way around it. And you've got to begin to think differently about money. Because if it's God that's going to give me the power to get wealth, then I'm going to have to start thinking differently. Okay? I'm done with that for today. There's so much more. Guys, I could talk for a month straight. <laughs> yep. This is, I ain't even got started. I could talk for a month straight concerning this. I just simply want to get established in your mind percentage. You've got to start thinking in percents. Start with 10%. Start with that. God, I'm going to enter into this thing with you with 10%. And you start taking me from there. Okay? You've got to establish that with, between you and God. My 10. Here's my 10. And I'm going from there. Okay. Let's get up on our feet. You're going to have to educate yourself. And nobody going to do this for you. I can stand up here and talk. 
I can't cram it into your head. If you want your financial situation to change, then you're going to have to change. Your thinking is going to have to change. It ain't your job that needs to change. It's your mind that needs to change. It don't matter if you had $100,000 a week coming to your pocket. If you don't know how to manage it, if you don't know how to move it, if you don't know how to multiply it, then it will go through, you will run through it like liquid, liquid water. <laughs> no, because be, water can be frozen. Or it can be vapor. It can be vapor, it can be vapor too. You, you'll run through it. You'll go through it like, you got to start thinking different. You got to start thinking different. Anybody got any question? Can you shut that off? Anybody got any question? Ask me now. 